Hello, everybody. I'm Polly Dawkins, Executive Director of the Davis Finney Foundation. I am here today in the beginning of March for National Nutrition Month, and we are presenting a webinar on nutrition and Parkinson's. Uh, so to start off, let me introduce our, our my co-panelist, Kristen Gustashaw. Hi, Kristen. Hello. Thanks for having me back. We are so Welcome, glad everybody. to have you. Really glad to have you here. Would you uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, maybe where you where you work, and um, how long have you been working in the in the Parkinson's and related uh, disorders community? I have been working in the field of nutrition almost, we're going on 25, 30 years. And in the field of like movement disorders, Parkinson-isms for, I mean, at least 20 years now. I kind of triple, my major focus early on in my practice was older adult nutrition and aging strong and well. Mm -hmm. And with aging comes a lot of disease states. And um, Parkinson's being one of them. And I kind of, we have a center of excellence at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, where um, I work and have worked for 24 years now. And it's just a robust, amazing, dynamic institution where I've really been able to have so many amazing experiences with so many um, different movement disorders. And I think the thing I've learned the most is Parkinson disease is just one small part of all different type of neurological dysfunctions. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, paving the way through that as the dietitian, a lot of it comes down to my message is very similar, regardless of your diagnosis. So I know that can be frustrating for some people where they are either just learned they've had the disease or been struggling with the disease. And all of a sudden they see a doctor and they say, well, it's kind of has a different flavor as sometimes they describe. Um, but when it comes to my role, um, I really, we adapt how your disease progresses regardless of kind of the roots of it. So it's um, it's kind of nice because even if your diagnosis shifts a little, you don't have to get a new dietitian. That is nice. So why is it important for us to talk about nutrition, hydration, and diet? Why is that an important part of aging strong or aging well? So it's just critical our bodies get the fuel and the tools it needs to survive. You know, and I know that sounds so simple, but we often just forget about it because the human body is so utterly resilient mm. that we really take it for granted. You know, we can skip a meal, we can have some junk food, not be hungry, um, and we can just go a long time on our own resources until we kind of hit a wall. But as we age kind of the reservoir of what our bodies can pull from kind of shrinks. And then if we have diseases on top of it, the disease may be um, kind of deteriorating those resources faster. Mm -hmm. So nutrition just becomes, you know, exponentially critical that that part is being managed. So I often tell people, you know, I met you because of X disease, Parkinson's, but I am hopeful that that only means you're going to pay that much more attention to your body because I often, a lot of the messaging might be the same. If I just met you because you want to age strong mm -hmm. now, it just, if you don't pay as much attention to your nutrition, your disease progression is going to be um, potentially more dramatically impacted by that and your aging process. Mm. question we get asked all the time, Kristen, is, is there a specific diet that is better for Parkinson's? And I get that all the time. Uh, there is not one diet that says, you know, if you follow these rules, you are going to either cure your disease or your disease will be managed. You'll stop it in its tracks. What we do know, though, and time and time again, as we look at research and we start comparing it to Parkinson's specifically or movement disorders, neurological um, health, the mind diet keeps floating to the top. And that's kind of my favorite diet. And it's part of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So 
the Mediterranean diet is kind of a cultural way of eating. It's very rich in produce and those dark green antioxidants. We know Parkinson's affects how your brain works. And we know, I like to consider our body like a vascular highway. And our brain is such a vascular, just super highway mm -hmm. that if we can give it a lot of antioxidants, these really rich foods, we can preserve the integrity of your brain for longer periods of time. So we don't know yet what exactly we can do nutritionally for specifically, you know, is there something we're going to find out one day for dopamine? And we'll say, yep, let's eat this or take this pill and we are set, right? We don't have that, but we do know that we can keep the brain as strong as possible with laden with antioxidants. And it kind of can help preserve all the other functions because remember, Parkinson's is only one disease. And it doesn't, unfortunately, um, any neurological disease you may have, whatever flavor your brain has, it doesn't protect you from getting other diseases. Mm -hmm. It doesn't protect you from cardiovascular disease or diabetes or heart disease, all of these things. Um, so we can really kill two birds or multiple birds, you know, a whole forest, a whole flock of birds with healthy eating. So not only are you going to preserve your brain health, you're going to keep your muscles stronger. And we know when you have this disease, what does it affect? It affects how your muscles work, how your brain thinks, their cognition. And when you look to a dietitian, you know, the brain healthy foods, check all those boxes and can really give you such a rich source of um, kind of foundation to mm -hmm. help your body tackle this disease. You know, I like to say, you know, when we, if you're an athlete, you train, right? You train for that marathon, you train for that sporting event, whether it's, you know, your diet is training you to combat this disease. Mm -hmm. So the more you can train, the stronger you can be, whatever your disease is, we're going to progress. We know that some of this may slow down the progression. Mm -hmm. We know that some of it may prevent the disease or the onset of the disease. But wherever you are, we know a good diet is going to help you fight it and win and live a more independent, strong life. You know, often when I ask people, if you were all here today with me, I'd have you raise your hands like, who wants to live forever? <laughs> and no hands go up maybe one. Every once in a while, my dad thinks that's a good idea. But <laughs> most people, then when I ask the second question is, who wants to live independently as long as possible? And then the hands fly up. And that's what diet, and I'd be remiss to not mention exercise, can do for these types of diseases. Yeah. So the mind diet, and I don't know if and now would be a time to share that screen, but we can look sure, at, you know. Sure, let's do that. And and let's, uh, could you say the word and maybe spell the word so we're all hearing it correctly? Yes, so it's M, it's an acronym. Let me see if I can share this screen here. It's an acronym for the Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. So it's right here. Ah. Uh. And somebody asked, what does DASH mean? Or is that a special? So, and that's another acronym. So that is an actual diet that was kind of created. And that's the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. Mm. And you can Google the DASH diet. Um, that, just like the MIND diet, now there's a million cookbooks, a million resources. People are trying to really, you know, capitalize on recipe books and making money off of these diets for, for the good, you know, they're not quackery. Um, but the NIH, the National Institute of Health has like the, a gigantic booklet filled with what the DASH diet components are and like a week or two of recipes and menu planning. So often it's a little bit more than people can handle right away. Um, the Mediterranean diet is a little bit too um, generic and it doesn't have as much meat. And this is one of the reasons I love the MIND diet because it really tells you there's like 10 brain healthy foods that you should incorporate into your diet on a regular basis and five that you should try to limit. 
So every day our brains need whole grains and vegetables of any kind. Um, so it, it showed that when we looked at, it started with an Alzheimer's population. That's how this diet was kind of like, what can we do to prevent Alzheimer's or slow it down? And since they be kind of came up with these 10 to do's and fives to not, um, now they look at how is this affecting Parkinson's? And sure enough, it's looking beautiful. How is this affecting that vascular highway of cardiovascular disease? It's looking beautiful. And it's not surprising as a dietitian of so many years that when you look at the types of foods the diet suggests are good, it's your dark, beautiful, green leafy vegetables. But I love to point out that the MIND diet showed that people who ate any other vegetable, so about a serving of greens a day, and that's one cup. So imagine if you cooked a cup, one cup of spinach, it barely make a tablespoon. So if you don't like it, you can sneak it in. If you love it, you know, you can get more. And these are kind of like the, the minimums. So with the green ones, you can add more to your diet. The red ones, you don't want to go over. Um, but two things I love about this diet that points out is, you know, I don't think anyone would be shocked as you read this list on the screen, the beans, legumes, dark vegetables, you know, poultry, your skinless chicken breast, berries. Um, but it, if you look at like the DASH diet, Mediterranean diet, it may say up to like nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So that doesn't mean you shouldn't hit that mark. But this research showed that people who even ate any other vegetable, they didn't isolate potatoes versus a squash. I know in time, they'll continue to be able to, you know, kind of flesh that out more. But simply stated, if you ate beans a few times a week, you ate dark green leafies almost every day and any other veggie of your choice, not fried, you right. were you kind of fell into this category of, of neural protection. And so that's any other veggie. And then the other thing I love to call out is fish. So when we look at heart guidelines and all of these things, we always say we should get two servings of fish a week. And I don't disagree with that. We should all get at least two servings of fish. And I don't push a lot of supplements, but if you really don't get any omega-3 fatty acids, that may be a place you'd get a supplement from. But this data even showed one serving of fish a week was that powerful. Mm -hmm. So when you're going to eat something once a week and get any you know significant scientific data around it, it's really saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, I have something good for you. Um, and then I have had questions about people saying, well, can you get too many, too much fish? And then I often point to the Eskimos where the majority of their diet is fish. You can get too much potentially in a supplement form of any of these nutrients. But when you look at the food sources, it's really hard um, to get too much of any one of these nutrients. And then the bottom- on the, what, on the what to eat. On, of any foods, really. Any when you of look the, at diet, okay. um, it's really hard to get too much unless you have some sort of metabolic disorder where you have to watch a particular nutrient, but those are super rare. So I always say food first um, because it comes in its natural package. That's where most scientific research comes from, where we looked at a food, it was doing something, then we extrapolate the nutrients from that food and say, what, what nutrient was doing it? But it's not in the whole food form. So it's kind of taking a, a data and kind of diluting a little bit, just like an average, you know, so it may have some founded benefit. But I know one of the questions that a lot of people ask in, in Parkinson's um, or any disease really is supplements. Mm -hmm. You know, which, what supplements should I take? I hear CoQ10 is amazing. Or do I need, you know, extra vitamin E? How about vitamin C, creatine, like all of these things. And there's no really hardcore data saying your body needs an excess amount of it. With this disease though, some people may be low in some of the omega-3s or vitamin D specifically. So you want to make sure you're getting adequate amounts, mm -hmm. um, calcium, adequate amounts, because bone loss goes along with this disease, as does muscle loss. And when you look at the data between muscle and bone, if you're losing one, you're losing another. So we talk a lot about bone health and where do we get foods to help our bones? We get sources of 
um, good sources of calcium. And vitamin D is very poor in all of our food supply. So that's another one where you may have to supplement your um, vitamin D. Uh, before I go on, the, it's the butter and margarines, sweets, red meats, and whole fat cheese, not your lower fats necessarily, but your whole fats and fried foods. These are kind of the limiting foods um, we talk about. Uh, but when it comes to supplements specifically, there's not a specific supplement I say, yep, you got to take it unless I know you are not getting enough of it. So calcium is often one that people don't get enough of in their diet. Um, some people with Parkinson's are a, like, they've heard dairy is something we want to limit. And the really the um, the verdict is still kind of out. And when we look at whey protein, it's so phenomenal for our bone health or our muscle. Um, and it often comes with the calcium. I am a proponent of whey protein um, with our food, you know, not necessarily having to take more. Super. Let's, I kind of uh, jump through a lot of things. Sorry. That's, yeah. That. Let's uh, let's stop sharing screen, if you will. And um, we, for those of you in the audience, we will share these resources with you. So if that was too small for you to see, or you couldn't catch it all, which I certainly couldn't, we'll share that resource with you that uh, Kristen shared with us. And we may go back to it. There may be some other points that we want to go back to. So you've touched on a bunch of questions that people have asked. And there is a question that keeps coming up, and it was on your slide of what to eat. And before we move on, let's just address this topic of wine. It it said on there, uh, a small glass, five ounces of red wine daily or grape juice. More is not better. Can you address the, the red wine topic or wine topic? So that's often one, you know, if you don't drink, you don't need to. Um, there's not enough data saying we absolutely need alcohol in our diet. Um, when we look just again at research with wine or any alcohol, there is some potential for cognitive um, uh, benefit of this small dose of alcohol. And then when you look at red wine, it actually has those additional polyphenols that are those antioxidants, but in a very small dose. So it's not like a free pass to say, oh, I'm going to drink all this wine and I'm going to protect my brain. Because after about five ounces, then it becomes the opposite. It loses its benefit and can be detrimental. So it's really looking at, even when you look at just heart healthy benefits and we look at red wine, um, there's more research. We used to say two drinks for a man, one drink for a woman. And more data is kind of saying one for everybody. After one, you know, you're doing it um, just for like enjoyment versus any sort of health benefit. And, you know, obviously the negative side effects of potentially being, um, you know, loss of balance. We know mm -hmm. that that's an issue. It can be um, interact with your medication. So you really have to step into the alcohol territory cautiously. Um, okay. I often tell people, to consider, you know, purple grape juice or pomegranate juice, hundred percent juice, put it in your wine glass, sip on it, especially pomegranate juice. It's so expensive, but I often tell people it has this like mega dose of antioxidants, probably more than even the wine you were going to buy. And a, you know, a bottle of wine for $10, you don't, most people don't bet too much of an eye at, but that pomegranate juice is just laden. Then you shouldn't drink too much juice. Um, so that small, you know, five ounce glass of juice is something that you should kind of savor and enjoy. Got it. Super helpful. Thank you for clarifying that. So you've been working in this field for quite some time. Uh, somebody asks first in your field, what's the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? If somebody's looking to add a person to their team, what's what's the difference? So a dietitian has to be, um, has to have a four-year degree, has to go through an internship, and now they're actually even requiring a master's as we go on. Um, when I was getting um, my education, a master's was an optional, PhD optional. So that's for one. So you know you have this really deep um, rooted nutrition knowledge and physiology mm -hmm. and all the biochemistry that goes along with what happens in your body. 
to be a nutritionist, by definition, you have to eat. So everyone on the call today <laughs> can call themselves a nutritionist. It's just something who, somebody who eats. So you really want to be careful to ask the questions like, what is your background? What mm -hmm. is your knowledge? And now life coaches and wellness coaches have become super pop culture. And it's in trainers, you know, they, they might take a class online of a, you know, an hour or two and they get a certificate and they can put all those things on. And it's not saying that they don't know what, you know, have good ideas. Um, but that's the biggest difference is that educational piece. So always know your source. And we even hear this about physical therapists and things there. There's a lot of people who can help you move your body, but a physical therapist or a, um, who's specializes in Parkinson's and those types of movement disorders is really a game changer to make sure you get paired up with the right person. Wonderful. Thank you. One of the important topics that we can't go on without addressing, it, and we hear this question, in fact, we did a care partner meetup uh, yesterday, and one of the care partners said, what do you mean protein? And Parkinson's and protein and Parkinson's medications don't mix. What's that about? So could we talk a bit about food interactions with Parkinson's medications specific, yes. and then specifically protein? And I love this question even more now than when I was a new dietitian in Parkinson's world. Because as a new dietitian, if I heard my patients went on Parkin on um, sentiment or carbidopa, levodopa, um, it's really the levodopa. There is this drug nutrient potential interaction. And I say potential because early on, I told everybody, oh, read the package, you know, wait, take your medicine, wait 30 minutes, um, eat. And then if you're going on the other side, eat your meal, wait two hours. So thinking always, it takes longer for your body to digest a full meal. That's the two hour mark. So eat and then wait two hours or the medicine, 30 minutes, and it should be in and out of your gut. However, now as a more seasoned dietitian, there is an entire horizon of uh, spectrum of how that interacts with each individual person. So my biggest comment is make sure you ask, you see if your body is interacting with that medication. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't interact, just eat freely because what happens is I have found way too many people over the last few decades who stop simply eating because they can't find that moment. They think mm -hmm. they're too, they become too nervous, too anxious, and even anxiety can cause, you know, GI discomfort. So take this with a grain of salt. It's a possibility of an intervention that you may have to implement um, if you don't have any problem, you know, a lot of people get started on a small dose of those medications and it's, you know, three times a day, it's no big deal. You just eat around it. Um, for other people, they may have to start taking the medicine with a little food and then they think, oh, it has to piece of, be a piece of bread, but even a piece of bread has three grams of protein in it. So I say eat freely. And then if they're not seeing the effect, the medicine they were expecting, then can, before upping the dosage, then maybe finagle um, how often or when you're doing that medication timing. Um, the other thing that goes into play, this is why it's, it's very individualized, is the type of protein that you consume may mm. uh, affect you. So it's not just as simple of for some people half hour and then, you know, an hour or two after sometimes people do better or fine if it's a more complex meal. So there's more carbohydrate and then a low protein. So like a cereal and a glass of milk would be fine because the cereal is all this, and milk has carbohydrate and there's some protein with it, but that ratio is beautiful. Um, and then oh, it looks like my yeah, we had a power surge. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, so I have worked with people. I've only in, in over 20 years, I've only at least connected with somebody because we always know there's people who just haven't connected to the right resource. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I did have a man who was struggling desperately with this protein nutrient interaction. The medicines just weren't working. And it's something called a protein redistribution. 
where you take and only have about 10 grams of protein and one egg is seven. So it adds up quickly. So no protein during the day and all your protein in the evening. But that does come at an expense of really not being very functional in the evening time. For his lifestyle, it worked. It changed his lifestyle. Then he had to go to a wedding. One of his grandchildren was getting married. So a few, like a month before that wedding, we flipped him, I call it, and we did all the protein during the day so he could be on at night. So that's kind of the most extreme case that I've had. And it was beautiful, though. I mean, it just saved his life. For most people, though, um, it it's not that uh, intensive. But I do, if you're okay with Rush, we put together a booklet and I can mm -hmm. share it with you. Absolutely. And there's a whole section on kind of the different categories to consider. But even on some people's booklets, I write, do not use unless necessary. So take it Thank with you. caution. Let's talk about the role of hydration and the importance of hydration with medication, with gut motility, all of it. So tell us, Tell us why hydration is important. We could have started off the conversation with hydration, even if we never got to food. It All is right. the number one most important thing that you're going to do today. Oh, wow. For all those reasons you just said. Mm -hmm. um, my best analogy is if you don't have enough water on board, it's like trying to ask your body to ice skate on concrete. Mm. Nothing's going to work right. And you are going to wear it out immediately. Mm. So. If you do nothing else, if you can really focus today on how am I going to get better hydrated? Now, the answer to that is not an easy answer because mm -hmm. for everybody, that, whether it's dexterity, whether it's swallowing, there's a million reasons why we're not hydrating. But the human body was also not programmed to drink until they're thirsty. We get already dehydrated. So never just wait for your thirst cue. And as you get older and with this disease, those cues start turning off faster and faster. So you have to know you need to drink on a regular basis. Your medications rely on hydration to be able to be metabolized. Your gut motility requires enough liquid. So if you are struggling with constipation, which is one of the most number one you know, difficulties with this disease, if you're struggling with it, you can um, dramatically improve your health and well-being if you just stayed hydrated. Um, and what that looks like is a little different for everybody. So, you know, most people think it has to be um, eight cups of water a day. Um, but if you're somebody who's 200 pounds, that may be 13 cups, you know, 14 cups. If you're somebody who's very slight, it may be six or eight cups. You know, if you're in the 95, you know, it's very small stature. So just really making sure you're staying hydrated and, um, you know, paying attention to like what your urine looks like. Some medications you may be on, even B vitamins. If you take a B vitamin for whatever reason, it turns your, your urine bright fluorescent yellow. So that bright fluorescent yellow is different than a darker kind of brownish yellow that's more of a sign of dehydration. My rule of thumb is to tell people, you know, get in all the fluid you need for the day that you, you've been told is appropriate, your eight glasses, 10 mm -hmm. glasses, um, and then check what your urine looks like. That's what your rule of thumb should be. Folks are asking, what counts as fluid? Okay. Um, I have, I hope I can pull it up. I don't know. Something happened with my connections. So... What counts as fluid is anything non-caffeinated can count uh, one for one. Here we are. Um, here's my slide. Okay, I'm going to try to screen share really quick because I think pictures say a lot. This was the water slide. So, you know, if you're 60 to 80 pounds, we're looking at three to five cups. And this is 220 pounds. You're looking at 13 to 17 cups. So this one, though, is amazing. So water, 100%, obviously. Any non-caffeinated beverage, 100%. Juice, 100%. Fat-free milk, almost virtually 100%. But look at the water you get from your food. And when we talk about these antioxidants, nutrient-rich foods, 
it's killing two birds with one stone. Not only are you getting those antioxidants, you're getting those fluids that your body needs. Um, you know, if it has a lot of pulp in it, you may be looking at 80 to 90%. Um, but spinach, 91%, strawberries, 91%, cucumbers, even pizza, I like to point out as one of, you know, the America's favorite food is almost 40 to 50% water. So if you're eating enough, which that also is a, a struggle for some people, it's like, I'm in, having this unintentional weight loss. I don't have an appetite. I'm not eating a lot. We know that's not going, you know, you lose weight. A lot of people think, oh, of course I'm not eating. I'm losing weight. But what I think of even before the weight loss is you are also dehydrating mm -hmm. because water is such a rich um, nutrient in our foods. We don't look to our foods as having water, but if you're not eating as much, you know, we think, okay, you need to drink enough. You need to eat enough. It's not just for the nutrients. It's for that water piece too. That's yeah. We'll share this as well. Cause this is really uh, the visual is super helpful and the strategies to get water in. Somebody's asking, you know, what about nighttime incontinence and trying to get all this water in? And, and if you're incontinent at night, how do you, how do you balance those two things? And, um, a lot of times it's a lot of people don't think about caffeine staying in their system. So caffeine is kind of a diuretic and it can really affect you and your sleep um, for 12 hours. So for one, some people are incontinent no matter what, but some people, if they their sleep being disturbed and not getting in that deeper sleep, if you can get into a deeper sleep, you may sleep through needing to go to the bathroom. So if you're in that lighter sleep, you may feel that urge to go and you're up you know, kind of in that twilight. So you're going to go. Whereas if you got a deep sleep, you won't necessarily have an accident. You'll get through that kind of twilighty need. Um, but beyond that, with true incontinence, um, food is a fabulous way to get a bit of a time released amount of water. Mm -hmm. So watermelon for some people may be too much water um, at night, but having like a bowl of fruit in the evening may help keep you hydrated without having that kind of big flushing effect that a full cup of water has. So you may have to, you know, cut water off a little earlier in the evening and liquids, maybe have some really, you know, yogurt and fruits um, as an evening snack versus something like a granola bar or, you know, just nuts or something that you may enjoy, but it's not going to have that water piece with it. So you're staying hydrated and you're kind of slowing up the potential for that incontinence. So if you can kind of up front load your water for the day and get more from food in the evening, that might help. Let's hop into uh, the question about, I've seen some questions about unintentional weight loss and the other side of the coin, weight gain. Um, and, and maybe the role of a care partner if we can mix some of those together. So which one would you like to tackle first, knowing what you see in, in the clinic more often? So I would say it's probably even more, not even an 80-20. It's okay. more of a 90-10 of weight loss, unintentional weight loss. Now, again, oh, wow. that's in the population that I see. Yeah. So often if you're gaining weight, you're maybe thinking, you know, oh, it's something I have to just manage myself. So that may just be, you know, overshadowed by the fact of that you're at greater risk for that unintentional weight loss piece. Okay. Um, so that is often what we see with this disease, that you have some sort of phantom unintentional weight loss where you feel like you're eating enough and you're doing the right things, but we're still seeing, you know, your body's just not keeping up. So we have to often start talking about fortified foods and nutrient dense foods. Um, so that I think is much more the case with a lot of people that I end up seeing um, and how to supplement, you know, I, I often, am, I get teased at the clinic in our clinic because I find so many different ways to hide so many nutrients in the smallest amount of bites. That's like what I specialize in, right? Oh, but if you're overweight or you're gaining weight, we want to do the opposite. So actually that same chart that I showed about all those produce, if you're having a hard time maintaining your weight, if you could look to produce, especially vegetables, and then some fruits as your main source of nutrients, um, that is going to help keep you full. 
it's going to help kind of manage how much you're eating. On the flip side, if you're losing weight, those are fabulous foods to consume, but now we have to figure out ways to add more calories to that. Mm -hmm. So you can use it in both regards. So somebody who's trying to manage their weight um, and sugar cravings sometimes become an issue. We're still, it's a bit of a, we're still trying to figure out the, the biochemistry of if we can help that a little bit, but when your dopamine goes down, your sugar, you know, your body wants more sugar, things like that. Um, to combat that, you know, berries with whipped topping versus, you know, a full strawberry shortcake um, or a full bowl of ice cream. How can we do a little dabble of the sweets, but more of the produce on board can help in both regards. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're losing weight and you um, can't stop the weight loss, people are very oftenly shocked, especially care partners. And I think it's even harder for the care partner to kind of let the floodgates go off. You know, like we keep saying we need all these healthy foods in our body to help our brain. And it's um, it's very hard to wrap your head around if somebody's losing weight, has no appetite, may have chewing and swallowing problems on board, anything you can get them to eat is a win because mm -hmm. now the unintentional weight loss becomes the primary disease. It, everything else is secondary because you won't have a body to help or heal if it keeps losing weight. So, you know, we add in the gravies and the sauces and the ice creams and the full fats and the olive oils. And we try to get as many calories on board as possible. Um, so picking their favorite foods, even though they may not be healthy, we need to get calories into them. That becomes the primary objective. Well, yeah, I can imagine that's a, that's a hard, you've been trained your whole life to eat in a particular healthy way. And then all of a sudden to say, doesn't matter. We just got to eat. Yeah. Yeah. And for care partners, you know, I know um, they also, you know, having, we don't want to make them short order cooks. They have to make one meal, but I, I don't want to gain weight. My loved one or care, whoever I'm taking care of needs to gain weight. So, you know, really looking at how I can make a meal and then take that meal that I'm going to eat and take just maybe one or two more steps to fortify the person who needs the extra calories versus saying, okay, I have to make two different meals. Right. You know, it's like, um, we're going to have a salad and I may put different components on the end of this salad and, and different ones on mine idea. So you're not feeling like you're cooking two different meals every single meal. Yeah. Uh, Marty mentions in the comment that uh, unintentional weight gain after deep brain stimulation surgery. That is a big shock. And I think people are, clinicians are getting a little better warning people about that. But early on in my practice, people were not at all told. And that is something that can happen. Your body's just working totally different. Um, even, you know, the not moving that unintentional movement, you're not burning that energy. So even that one actual physical component of the deep brain stimulator, it can make a huge difference. So mm -hmm. kind of being prepared for that, having a nutrition plan on board before you have that um, deep brain stimulator placed, you know, pairing up with a dietitian if you have the ability to is a good idea. And exercise. Very true. And that's what, that's what Marty mentions here too. Um, you had mentioned a few things uh, pr about promoting weight gain. Uh, and somebody asks, are there any good snacks that aren't high in protein that promote weight gain? So um, the, my two favorites are avocado oil and olive oil. And I think one of the things people really enjoy is like dipping out bread in olive oil, maybe before, a, you know, just having a snack of that. Um, it's not really high in um, protein, mm -hmm. but anytime if you now more mainstream because of the ketogenic diet, there are things and recipes out there you can find that are called fat bombs. They're like the worst name ever. FAT bombs. And 
Um, they do have some protein, but mostly it's like a fat, low carb type of um, little balls. And there's different recipes um, where it calls for like butter and maple syrup and um, almond butter. And it's just a whip of a combination of, of those types of things. So oils are really a great place and full fat, um, like heavy cream. Anytime you can do some of those types of things, they're right. not going to be as high in protein. Super. Thanks for that. We've got a, a bunch of questions. I'm going to sort of go, because we've got 15 minutes left, I'm going to go through a bunch of questions here. Uh, and my colleagues will also alert me, I hope, to one I may have missed. Let's talk about dairy. It seems to be a controversial topic do we do dairy? Do we not do dairy for Parkinson's? Why? Why not? What are your What are your thoughts on this topic? So I am in the camp of dairy is a good thing. However, um, if you are feeling this is one of those things with the protein um, nutrient interaction, it may depend on the type of protein. So if you are somebody who's you know, I have had people where they if they avoid dairy protein their medication doesn't have that interaction. For those people, I say, okay, let's wait on the dairy. When you just look at brain health and dairy, I think that the reviews are too mixed when you look at the research. And the gut benefit of dairy is pretty strong when you look at yogurt and um, probiotics, prebiotics, those types of things from dairy and the protein being whey protein. I just think it has too many good benefits, unless, of course, you, you know, are having some specific interaction with them. Okay, super. Another question around the role of a fiber in the diet. Tell us a little bit about fiber. So fiber does help move our digestive system along. Your gut is such an intricate system that it needs this balance of the types of fibers, the gut bacteria, the water, all of it um, taken into consideration to help move your bowels while your muscles may or may not be working. And they may work great. One day you could have like a good Parkinson's day for the rest of your body, but your gut could be off or vice versa. So things like Metamucils or um, those types of fibers, they can cause gas and bloating. And for certain people, it's like a no-no. For other people, um, it can be helpful. So I say food first. Um, and even like all brand or all brand buds, those types of cereals that are coming in with other nutrients are kind of my first line, um, uh, of defense. And it has to come along with that water piece. Right. Are there other strategies for constipation besides some of these supplements? Uh, you said all brand brand buds. Are there other things somebody's asking about green tea? Sydney's asking about green tea for constipation. So teas, warm liquids help with constipation. Um, there's also Senna, which is confused. So there's Senna Cot, there's Senna Pills, right? But there's a Senna Tea, S-E-N-N-A. Um, there's different brands on the market. And that is a nice natural laxative. Mm -hmm. um, it says to seek for two minutes. And I would... Even that one is something you can see more or less and get a more robust effect from it. Some people use it, the warmth of the hot tea, but even um, in the summertime where you just drop the tea bags kind of in a cold water um, and kind of let it brew up like that can be kind of helpful. Um, there's also recipes for it, um, like a fruit paste where you can use senna tea as part of like you turn a fruit compote of figs and dates and prunes raisins and I make it into like almost like a fig Newton uh, mm -hmm. liquid and you can spread it on toast and things. Um, Nopalis or cactus is also really natural, good laxative. Papaya, papaya enzyme is something that's become more popular lately um, for people to try. Great. Thank you. We've had some questions about caffeine and chocolate. And some of those questions come together. Can you address the uh, consumption of caffeine and chocolate? So caffeine is something, if you're drinking one or two cups a day, um, whether, you know, if it's coffee or a tea, that's different than like a Starbucks mega dose. 
you know, a natural brewed coffee cup has about 35 milligrams of caffeine, but some of this like really potent coffee house coffees um, could be up to 200, 300 milligrams. So you really have to kind of see where we're getting like two cups of coffee is about 70 milligrams total of caffeine. Um, that's not considered too much caffeine. Mm -hmm. Caffeine can be very dehydrating. It can be a diuretic. It can make you jittery. So with this disease where your muscles are kind of like confused, we don't want to give them any more reason for you to be confused or, you know, it can even cause lightheadedness. So um, we want to watch that we're, we know where the symptoms are coming from and mm -hmm. can we do anything about it? So it can dehydrate you, can worsen constipation. When it comes to chocolate, uh, same thing, you know, a cheap chocolate's not going to have much caffeine in it probably, but one of those really dark, rich, um, latent antioxidants may have a lot of caffeine in it. So you just kind of have to benchmark it. And when we look at desserts and things, you know, just like the wine, uh, you know, an ounce of dark chocolate is kind of the the recommendation, not those gigantic bars of, of dark chocolate. Not Darn necessarily it. more is not better. Super. Uh, organic versus non-organic food. If if you have the option for organic and you have the, you know, the stores that sell it and the the, the funds to be able to buy it, is that a benefit or no? So organic is a, a like kind of a a unique word in in the nutrition world because organic is not only based on is something nutritionally more balanced or more powerful. Mm -hmm. Organic means the way it's been grown and in certain particular environments that food because it didn't have the natural or the the pesticides or herbicides around it it may be a, have grown under more distress. So it actually may have less nutrient content in it, mm -hmm. um, but you didn't have the pesticides or the herbicides in it. So it may be that you're, you know, eating cleaner, but nutritional quality of that food may not be that much better. So it's, you know, if I want, I have almost as a dietitian, I feel like haphazard not separating those two out. So nutritionally speaking, it may not be always a hundred percent better for you. Um, if you're looking straight up at vitamins and mineral contents of a particular food. Um, if you're looking at globally, is it better for our world? Yes. Organic and especially hundred percent organic. They even watch like what kind of fuels the trucks use to get it to our, to and from. Um, so all of that said, we don't know kind of if our environment can affect how our, the, the actual diagnosis of the disease or the cause of the disease, um, then organic would be fine, but I, it's not just going to be a slam dunk nutritionally better for you. Thank you. Any, uh, there's a question about chicken and the use of chicken. Is chicken okay in our diets? Yes, I think chicken is okay. Again, right. good quality chicken. Um, you know, we want to get the best quality we can eat. But again, I have a lot of people who say, oh, if I can't buy organic, I just can't eat it. It's too dangerous for me. And I'm not in that camp. Okay, super. Uh, many questions about psyllium, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Can you tell us yes. what is it and why so many questions in our community about psyllium? Well, because that's kind of like that outside source of fiber. You know, what do we do with psyllium? And it, and again, early on, it's a great, it moves your bowels along. Psyllium fiber is a great source of fiber. We just have to be careful that you're letting your body talk to you and then it's not causing problems if you start to become more constipated. And is this something that somebody, sh uh, one of our audience members should talk with their dietitian about or talk with their doctor about if they're wanting to introduce something like that into their diet? Um, I think so. I mean, I always think it's a good idea to talk to your physician if you, um, if you don't have one, uh, accessible to you, you know, uh, I say, you know, if you're going to first ask yourself, can I get more fiber from my food? If not, then if I am going to the bathroom, then maybe I really need to get it from like the Metamucils and that's, those are like the psyllium type products. But is there any foods that I can incorporate? Cause that's going to give me more than just one thing, more yeah. than just the fiber in my diet. 
Super. This hour is going by so quickly and our audience has so many questions. You have, you just have so much knowledge here. I want to ask you, Kristen, what have I not asked you about that you really feel like our community should know as we're closing down this hour? I think one of the things that we didn't probably talk about is actually um, how do I do it? Like, how do I implement it? Like I, I have so many doctor's appointments. I have so many things to do. How do I, you know, get in these meals that you're telling me I should be eating? Because mm-hmm. sometimes food is like the last thing on my mind, whether it's physically because I can't get it, you know, or I have so many things to go. So um, really looking at your kitchen or your cupboards, looking at how can I make meal preparation as easy as possible for myself? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even like simple things like um, like an apple slicer, you know, one of these little guys, there's this one where, and I think my screen is it's a little blurry, oh, but oops, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to unblur my background. Okay. Oh, there you go. So there's this one. And then there's this one. These are apple slicers, right? I know this sounds silly, but making your life easier will make your nutritional health better. Finding different ways to be able to, you know, eat more efficiently, whether it's because you had a chewing or problem or not, you know, it's, it's hard to get people to find the time to eat right. Um, Like a potato masher, whether it's just for potatoes or it's other things, you know, this is great for guacamole. Um, This little thing, how many, and you know, it sounds trivial, but even if you can open up jars, if you can take five less seconds to open up a jar with this, you know, turning the top having some of these quick things um, and easy to clean. You know, we talk Mm -hmm. about blenders and food processors, but the more simple strategies um, can really go like miles. Even if you're cutting up somebody else's food, um, using one of these types of, these are often for nuts, we think, but it can chop meat too, you Mm -hmm. know, or getting different types of um, little tools in the kitchen can really go a long way, but they have to be easy to clean. Yeah. You have to have some to store them or you will spend way too much money on them and never use them. You know what? I would love to come back with you and do a short segment. Not It doesn't have to be a full hour on these hacks, if you will, for getting yeah. food, eating, and maybe we could do that at a future date and, and uh, send that to our community. I, I love that. You, I love that too. Super. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Kristen, especially for your wealth of knowledge, your commitment to our community, your commitment to helping us age strong and well. And we hope to have you back again. 